So hello again. So in this presentation, I would like to introduce how to combine many small decision trees together to form more powerful models that we call ensembles. Uh, in particular, the two kinds of ensembles that are most successfully applied to tabular data are called gradient boosted trees and random forest. Uh, as usual, these uh, machine learning models can be used for supervised classification or regression problems. So we will start with introducing bagging, which is a, a shorthand for bootstrap aggregating uh, and the specific case of a random forest. And then we will move on to boosting and gradient boosting. So first, let's start with bootstra bootstrap aggregating uh, or for short bagging. And in particular, we will start with the classification case. So Let's consider this small toy data set where we have two input features, x0 and x1, and the target variable is represented as usual with the, the colors and the shape of the dots. Okay, So we have two groups and we want to classify based on the position uh, whether or not the plant, a, a new point should be blue or orange. So uh, bagging starts by resampling this data set several times uh, by taking a random subset of the data possibly with duplication, which means that it's um, uh, sampling with replacement, and to generate alternative version of this training set. So for instance, this training set, you see the orange data point here, the four orange data points here, they are also part of the original data. So, okay. Uh, and some of them might be duplicating, duplicated, so, but you cannot see them, but they would be uh, there several times in, in, the, in the training data. The goal of uh, using uh, sampling with replacement is to approximately preserve uh, the original training set size uh, by introducing some duplication. Okay. So for each of those uh, training, uh, new variations of the training set, we will fit um, uh, machine learning models uh, independently of one another. So for the first training set, we will uh, fit a first uh, decision tree, for instance. For the second uh, training set, independently of the first one, we will uh, fit another decision tree. And you see that the second decision tree here decided to split on the x1 variable here and to find an horizontal split. Whereas the first decision tree on the first training set used a split here on the x0 um, on the x0 feature and this x0 feature is also used for the third uh, decision split and each time you see that th this is the optimal decision split that we could do like for instance on this data set uh, here we just with one split we could perfectly classify this variation of the training set and here it's almost perfect there is just one prediction error here and here is also almost perfect there is only one prediction error here and then uh, we will combine those three models uh, to make them vote together. So uh, for instance, if you, if you uh, for a new test data point uh, represented in the gray position here, the gray cross will be classified independently by the three classifiers. So here it will be classified as orange. Here it will be classified as blue. And here it will also be classified as blue. So we make the, the, the three prediction vote and the final prediction of the ensemble is blue. So it means that here the, the ensemble model should classify this as blue. And it kind of makes sense. You see that you can observe that it looks closer to the blue points than to the orange point on average. In practice, when we do this uh, bagging uh, strategy, we will do many more replicate than of the original data, random uh, variation of the original training set. For instance, we could do that hundreds of times. Okay, so we will have hundreds of decision trees uh, to to make the prediction, and uh, the vote will uh, would be much more stable as a result. Okay. Um, Something also to consider is that here, for illustration purpose, we use very shallow decision trees with just one split node and two leaves. But in practice, we would tend to predict much 
uh, to use a much deeper trees. Uh, when you do bagging, you can use uh, trees that are as deep as you want. Each individual tree might overfit, but because we take this voting mechanism at the end, the, uh, the individual prediction errors tends to cancel out. And, and then uh, the resulting behavior of the ensemble model is not overfitting as much as the individual uh, decision trees. Okay, so this is a natural feature that comes from the fact that we do a random bootstraps of the data set and then aggregation uh, as a result. So the, the, the individual trees can overfit on the individual bootstraps, but because we take an aggregation step and because the trees were trained independently on a randomly initialized bootstrap independently, uh, as a result, we have uh, a reduction of the overfitting. So this is a very nice property of, uh, of uh, bagging trees and random forests. So in scikit-learn, you can use either bagging classifier, which is a generic uh, bagging strategy that can work for any kind of base class, uh, of, or any kind of a base classifier. Uh, and there is a specialized variant, which is called random forest, where the, the, the base model is a decision tree. Um, but here you could have done a bagging classifier for logistic regression. And here we would have replaced all the, the, the trees with individual uh, logistic regression models, for instance. Okay. I will explain what random forest do uh, more specifically uh, a bit later. First, let's consider the case of uh, bagging for regression. So here again, for, for uh, graphical uh, constraints, uh, we just consider the case where we have one single input feature x and uh, the target variable represented here on the y-axis. And the black points represent the training set. So here you see the shape of the data is this kind of wiggly shape, a curve, uh, that cannot really be uh, well approximated by uh, a straight line. Okay, so decision trees are probably required to, uh, or at least nonlinear models are required to to approximate this uh, this data set. So uh, bagging for regression proceeds uh, as we did for classification, meaning that we will uh, randomly uh, generate variations of the training set by taking subset of the training point at random. And you see that for each sub problem, we take a new random subset. And the, and the white dots here just represent the, the background uh, points that have not been selected in the subset, okay? So, and for each of those uh, variation of the training set, we will fit one regression model independently of the other. Okay, the fact that uh, it is independent is very important. So let's look at what we would get as a result. So here we will fit very deep decision trees. And if you recall the video of deep decision trees, uh, they tend to overfit by uh, going through all the, um, the training data points and they have zero uh, training error, but they can have individually large testing error. Uh, but this is not so much of a problem because then we will average uh, hundreds of those decision trees together to make them vote. And the, the, the final prediction of the ensemble is the average prediction of the individual models. And since the individual models make some kind of uncorrelated uh, errors because uh, of the random uh, selection of the data points, uh, then the, 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 the average prediction of the ensemble is much better, it's much smoother, and it doesn't overfit anymore. Okay, so this is, uh, we can really see the dramatic effect of the overfitting removal by averaging hundred, hundreds of these small models. Okay. Uh, actually, the, the individual models are not necessarily small because they can be very deep decision trees. Um, okay. So uh, I said that I would clar clarify the difference between uh, random forest and uh, bagging for decision trees. Uh, so bagging is a general strategy. You can apply it for linear models, for decision trees, or any kind of model. Uh, but we can specialize it specifically for decision trees and call that random forest. 
The only difference is that the individual trees of a random forest are uh, randomized. It means that uh, we, we both have the randomization process from the selection of the, of the training set variant, but on top of this randomization, there is a randomization process that happens inside the decision trees themselves. Uh, so more specifically, at each split, uh, when we fit one of the decision tree of the ensemble, for each given split, we will randomly select a subset of the features, x0, x1, and so on, and only consider the, the best split for that uh, random subset of the, of the features, which means that the, this decision tree will be slightly performing uh, worse than uh, the, the tree that we could have obtained by uh, finding the best split for all the possible features. Okay? We, we uh, intentionally uh, re reduce the performance of the, of the decision trees, but we do so randomly, which makes them uh, do uh, prediction errors that are uh, more um, uncorrelated. So the best split is taken among, among the restricted subset. And as a result, this extra randomization that we introduce decorrelates the prediction errors. And the fact that we have uh, decorrelated prediction errors makes the bagging uh, effect, the, uh, the voting effect of the bagged ensemble more, uh, more powerful. It works better because we have this extra randomization that is injected inside the decision tree learning procedure itself. Okay, so random forest is bagged randomized decision trees. Okay, all right. I think that's it for for bagging. And now there is the second family of ensemble models that is very popular for decision trees, which is called boosting. So here again we consider the classification task with the same uh, dataset as previously. And again, we will fit many decision trees. But instead of uh, fitting those decision trees independently of one another, we will first fit a, a first model on the full dataset. Okay? So here we consider a very shallow tree with just one split node and two leaf nodes. And uh, as a result, you have an underfitting model. Uh, for instance, here it decided to split here. And you see that there are three data points here, blue, that are on the orange side of the split. So it means that those three points are classification errors. And what the boosting procedure will do is that it will identify those classification errors and give them some large weight. And the other points that have been well classified by the first model will have some weights that, have, that are uh, much smaller. And then we will fit a, a second model on this, the same training set again, on the full training set again, but using those weights that are uh, derived from, from the prediction errors of the first model. So because we put more emphasis on the prediction error of the first model, so more weights for those three data points compared to the other data points, the second model that we will fit will decide to split this way, horizontally. So we get this, this model that was an horizontal split and uh, up we predict blue and below we predict orange. And here again, you see that this orange point here is still badly classified by the aggregation of the first two pre prediction functions. Okay, here you see uh, those points are well classified by, by this model. Those points are well classified by this model. When we take the sum of the two uh, prediction functions, we get good classification for all of those points, except for this one. And so we will fit a third model, and this time we will put much, much more weight for this uh, data point compared to all the other data points. And we get this decision function, which on the right hand side will predict orange and on the left hand side will predict blue, which means that according to this model, those points will be badly classified. But if you take the sum of all of the prediction function of the three model, you get as, um, as a result, uh, something that is quite good at, at predicting. 
And what is interesting here is that we decided to use small models that are underfitting individually, but because we combine them sequentially and each of them is trying to correct the errors of the previous models, uh, on aggregate, we get something that, that is less underfitting than, than the individual trees. Uh, I will illustrate this for the regression case where maybe it's even easier to see. Okay, so let's see the regression case. So here we again have uh, a 1D problem. So one input features and uh, the Y axis there is the output feature. So with a data set that is non-linearly uh, uh, approximate, but you cannot approximate it uh, linearly using a linear model, using linear regression or ridge regression. And here we use a decision tree with just a few leaves, uh, leaf nodes. So for instance, you see here there are th uh, one, two, three, four, five, five, I think, maybe six uh, leaf nodes. Uh, so you can guess that it's uh, restricted in, in depth. Okay, there is a few decision function, uh, split nodes. Uh, so there are probably five split, split nodes and six leaf nodes in, in this tree. Okay, and so as a result, this first decision tree uh, represented by the blue line here uh, is making a lot of prediction errors. In particular, here you can see that those points are, are very badly approximated by this uh, straight line here. So if we reweight those points to give them more importance and also slightly uh, you can give also uh, some importance for those points and those points, but those specific points close here, you see that the weights are very small. Okay, uh, you can fit a second model uh, <clears throat> that will focus uh, to classify uh, the only the points with the, the large weights. Okay, and so the orange line here is the decision function of the second model, the prediction function of the second model. We can combine the prediction function of the second model with the prediction of the of the first model, and we get as a result this new blue line where the second model has tried to correct the prediction function of the of the model before. Okay, and again here we can define new weights based on the prediction error. You see, you still see that those points, those points, those points, for instance, are, are badly approximated, and so we can reweight. Uh, those points, okay? And we will uh, do this uh, correction procedures many times, sequentially, one tree after the other. And so this is again an underfitting tree because it has just a few leaf nodes, uh, but you see it's focusing on correcting the, the prediction errors of the previous trees. And we aggregate the predictions of that tree into the ensemble and as a result, we get this uh, ensemble prediction. And here you see that the ensemble prediction is starting to be able to approximate all the uh, oscillations of the training data, even if the, uh, the, the base models are all underfitting. You see, this model is underfitting, this model is underfitting, this model is underfitting. Uh, each of them will, will basically miss some of the oscillations, but progressively we can refine the, the prediction and uh, get better and better. So we can do it one more time. Uh, here again, uh, the, those weights are important here. We, we get uh, this decision tree as a result. And in the end, we get something that is even more refined than the previous one. You see here that this was underfitting here and now it's less underfitting. So on the, on the Top row, you see the prediction function of the ensemble at each step. And on the, the bottom row, you see the, the difference, the correction effect of each step, if each uh, additional decision tree that we had in, in the ensemble. Okay. And so because we have this sequential effect, sequential correction effect of the decision trees, progressively, the expressiveness of the, of the ensemble is increasing. So even if it was underfitting at the beginning, progressively the underfitting effect of the of the model is being reduced progressively. Okay. So just now to clarify, uh, I, I, sp I spoke about boosting uh, as a general concept, 
And I mentioned that at each step, we would put weights on the, on the prediction errors. Um, this is what we call traditional boosting or ADA boosting. And this is a general procedure that you can apply for any base model uh, that can accept sample weights. So for instance, you could use logistic regression as the base model instead of decision trees. Or you can use decision trees, or you could use a support vector machines with kernels, or you could use neural networks. In practice, we tend to use decision trees because they are uh, non-linear and because they are fast, fast to train. Uh, kernel support vector machines will be much, uh, much uh, uh, slower to train and uh, they tend to overfit by default. So if you boost them, uh, they will overfit even more. So if you train shallow trees instead, they underfit individually, but then you can progressively make the ensemble work better and still make, make it work fast enough and uh, in a nonlinear manner. Okay, so very expressive model. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, the boost uh, classification, uh, Adaboost regression or Adaboost uh, classifier, they tend to be not uh, as not the best model. And instead, what we use is what we call gradient boosting. And for instance, in Scikit-Learn, you have uh, this class, uh, his, gra his gradient boosting classifier and his gradient boosting regressor. You also have the variant where you do not have the hist here. Uh, this is a detail that I will explain after. Uh, but what is important is that it's using the gradient boosting uh, procedure instead of the traditional boosting procedure. And the main difference is that instead of putting weights on the samples that have been badly classified, we quantify the classification error or the prediction error that we observe for those uh, training points according to a specific loss function that you can parameterize. So I won't go into the mathematical details, but keep in mind that it's more flexible because we can define this loss function to, to quantify uh, the errors. And basically each decision tree will try to uh, progressively minimize this error quantified by the loss function by predicting an, a negative uh, difference on this on those errors and by accumulating those negative errors you can decrease the total error of, of the ensemble and uh, in scikit-learn we have specialized the implementation to to work very efficiently with decision trees okay so uh, gradient boosting in, uh, in scikit-learn is, is uh, limited to decision trees. Uh, so I mentioned that you can use either traditional gradient boosting or the histogram variant. So the traditional gradient boosting classifier in scikit-learn is implemented in this class. Uh, it implements the exact method that was first described 10 years ago, uh, uh, no, 20 years ago already almost, uh, or 15, I'm not sure, uh, by, by Friedman, Jerome Friedman. Uh, and it works uh, fine for small training uh, problems from so small data sets, but it tends to be slow when you increase the size of the, of the data set. For instance, if you have more than 10,000 data points, uh, then there is uh, some uh, uh, complexity when you fit the decision trees. You have to sort the, the values and uh, uh, the sorting algorithm as n log n complexity, which means that when your n is increasing, where n is the number of samples, uh, it's getting slower and slower and slower. Um, so to, to make this work faster for large data set, we can remove this sorting procedure and approximate it what is what we call uh, histograms. Uh, on uh, discretized uh, numerical features. So all the numerical features are, are discretized to uh, 256 levels by default. And then instead of sorting the values to compute the splits, we will use histograms. So uh, I won't uh, try to explain in more details what it means. If you're interested, you can, uh, you can read the scikit-learn documentation. But the main takeaway is that it's much more efficient to deal with a large number of samples. So if you, you can use this class uh, in scikit-learn uh, on data sets uh, that have tens of millions of data points and it will still be tractable. And furthermore, this class also has a, a very efficient multi-core implementation that uses uh, many threads. So if, if you have a, a machine with several CPUs or several cores on, on, uh, per CPU, 
uh, then uh, it can run uh, very efficiently. Okay, some takeaway for the ensemble methods. Um, here I mentioned bagging and boosting. So those are two families of ensemble methods, but those are not the only ones. There are others uh, presented in scikit-learn, but I would say that those are the more important to understand. And so bagging and random forest, they fit the, uh, decision trees independently. So this is very important. Uh, the, but they are fit on a random subset of the data, random variation of the training set. And uh, even if they overfit individually, the fact that they have been fitted independently and the fact that we average their prediction makes it possible to reduce the overfitting. Okay. So uh, as a result, we tend to have a very large model because the, the individual trees are typically very deep. So the result is a very, very big uh, uh, model which can be a bit slow to predict, but still uh, very nice to train and very efficient because the, the, you, you do not have to be very careful with the hyperparameters. You just take a big random forest with a max depth equal none, and it tends to work uh, reasonably well. So it's, uh, it's very nice in that respect. It's very robust. Uh, you do not have to tune the hyperparameters a lot. Um, on the other hand, there is the gradient boosting methods. Uh, and in this case, we fit the decision trees sequentially and each uh, tree is trying to correct the mistakes of the previous ones. Okay. And each tree has to be uh, shallow uh, for two reasons. First, we want the individual tree to underfit individually because we will progressively increase the, the expressivity of the model by adding uh, models that correct for the errors of the previous ones. Uh, so progressively, we will reduce underfitting and potentially increase overfitting. But so we, we don't want to have the individual trees to overfit by default because that will make the problem worse. Okay. Uh, and the, the second uh, point of having shallow trees is that they are much faster to predict than deep trees. So as a result, even if you have hundreds of trees, the, those small trees are, are, are small in memory and fast to predict. So that's an additional benefit. Uh, and uh, because we combine them sequentially using this correction effect, uh, in the end, we have a very expressive model. So in practice, gradient boosting tends to perform better than random forest, slightly better. The difference is usually not very big, but uh, slightly better. Uh, but you have some additional hyperparameters to tune using a grid search, for instance. So uh, they can be uh, slightly, uh, um, you have to be slightly more careful to, to train them. Still, they are very robust, especially on tabular data. Uh, they, they usually are, are uh, among the state of the art models for, for tabular data. And they are fast to train if you use the histogram gradient boosting version and uh, they can be uh, deployed very efficiently uh, because they, they use uh, shallow trees. And so the, these gradient boosting uh, models are also implemented in other libraries such as uh, XGBoost or LightGBM and uh, the heat gradient boosting classifier and regressor method of scikit-learn are basically implementing the same very efficient uh, algorithm. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I will stop here for this presentation and uh, you will put this in practice in the in the next notebook. Thank you very much for for your attention.